actress. And um, I have done a couple of tours and um, did a show in the West End. And then I met Corinne um, on Viking and we did a cruise together there. So, yeah, all fun and games, really. Nice to meet you all. I'll go next. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Ben Bryant. Um, I'm based also in Atlanta, Smyrna, Georgia. So um, hopefully we're close to each other, Marcy. Um, I have a background in classical and musical theater. Uh, I, I performed in oratorio, both Los Angeles and uh, New York City, um, and then did musical theater. I was in The King and I on Broadway a couple decades ago, back when I was still performing. Um, uh, but for the past 20 years, 18 years, I've been vocal director at Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines, which is where I met Corinne. I was her director uh, once upon a time. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, so I've been in that with that company for a long time as a musical director, vocal director, and more recently, the last several years in casting. We're obviously on pause right now. Um, so I've been doing a lot of these kind of things, which has been great to actually reach out and meet people from all over the industry and in different mm -hmm. places. Um, so nice to meet all of you. Um, I'll go next. Oh, sorry. Please, of course that ahead. happens. That's the most socially awkward thing to happen. <laughs> uh, my name is Eden Shereen. I'm based in Tampa, Florida. Similar to what Marcy had said, although I'm not, I'm actually not exactly in Tampa. I'm just outside, but I've been doing songwriting and performing for the last eight years. Um, I'm a, have two records out. I got the opportunity to tour in the Philippines a couple years ago and travel back and forth between Tampa and Nashville for songwriting, performing and uh, modeling and acting work as well, which has been really exciting. I met, um, I met Corinne because uh, her mom worked with my mom quite a few years ago. I did a couple of vocal lessons with her when I was in high school, I believe. It was either middle school or high school. And uh, it's an honor just to be in a Zoom room with all of you guys and get to hear your story. So thank you for having me. <laughs> Um, my name is uh, Itai Shapira, and uh, I'm based in New York, and I am no doubt the worst singer um, in this group, <laughs> because um, primarily because I'm a violinist and composer. Um, I performed with Corinne a piece that I wrote um, for violin, piano, percussion, and chorus. Um, and um, we kept in touch uh, when I started to develop music for healing. And Corinne was one of the first people uh, we did a sequence uh, with for uh, movement rehabilitation. Wow. Oh, hi, I'm Lucas Tanous. Um, my background is very similar to Marcy's. I was also a, an opera singer for about 15 years. And then I became a speech language pathologist. And I now work primarily at two high schools in Harlem in New York City, but uh, I also work with private clients on voice optimization and um, accent reduction as well. And uh, I know uh, Corinne through Itai. Um, so it's, uh, I'm very grateful that I had the opportunity, well, of course, to meet Itai and, and Corinne. Uh, I've gotten to know uh, more over the last uh, couple of years and um, so I'm very excited to uh, be here and to be invited to be part of this wonderful panel. So thank you. And uh, lastly, um, I'm Lexi Lobianco. You know, it says Alexandra Walker. I'm Lexi Lobianco. Uh, Corinne and I go back to college days when we went to USF together. And I am still currently an opera singer, um, uh, but I unemployed. <laughs> <laughs> but have recently started my own uh, with my partner. We've started our own uh, live streaming business called Valhalla Media, where we go and we have been assisting companies like Chicago Opera Theater and the Met uh, Guild um, stream and film their their season and help them get back to work and help people just have an opportunity to do work. Uh, I'm originally from St. Petersburg, but currently in Chicago. And yeah, it, it's it's been an adventure. I similar to you guys with the, the with the therapies and 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 wanting to do uh, work that actually go, transcends just the stage. I just became a board member for Sharing Notes uh, here in Chicago, which is a, a healing company. Which is a it's a program that allows artists to go into hospitals and and sing and perform for uh, for patients and whatnot. So 
moving past what we do on stage and making an actual impact. Oh my goodness. So I'm just going to kind of host this. I'm hoping that we have several people watching on Facebook. I'm not able to see what's going on on Facebook right now. So hopefully we'll pop on. But for those of you who are watching on Facebook, I've just recorded this. And Marcy, I missed yours because I hit record too late. So can you go ahead and introduce yourself one more time for everybody? Okay, one more time. So I'm Marcy Meredith. I uh, am from, I'll tell you, Ben, because we're close by. I'm in Gwinnett County. I'm over in Lilburn. Lilburn, Georgia, which is just outside of Atlanta. Um, I have uh, a 15 year operatic career um, that I performed with 200 and, with the Atlanta Opera for over 250 shows. And um, then after that 15 year career, I went and got my master's degree in um, speech therapy or uh, communication sciences and disorders, if you wanna be fancy. And um, I've been working with Babies Can't Wait, which is a state run program that helps underserved uh, kiddos in this area. Um, working primarily with kids zero to three on developmental um, delays and such. I also continue to have a full studio and I use my talents on both sides of the fence to, um, to kind of hit a specific niche and have a specific um, healing bend to my uh, practice as well in my studio. So love it. Thanks for doing that. So you all are way too humble. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, you you know, as singers, we we all have this fear of of bragging or being too much, you know. And I don't want to have and I don't want to have that happen here. You guys all bring something amazing to the table, and I am so just personally humbled being around all of you because I've known several of you. Maybe some of you I've only known for a couple of years, and some of you I've known for. 25 years. I'm not going to, I should, should I, should I have said that Lexi? I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> we, we don't discuss those things. It's, that's what we drink. No, <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> so I would like this panel. Um, this is the first, of hopefully a few or many that I'd like to continue doing. Um, you know, I kind of caught you all during COVID, which was good because we're all sort of doing the same thing, you know, hopefully, which is, you know, sitting at home and connecting with each other, you know? <laughs> but I, I know I personally have some things that I would love to talk about because I know all of you all and I know what you all can bring to the table and what people, you know, if they're not tuning in on Facebook right now, it doesn't tell me how many people are watching on Facebook, but um, it's gonna continue to stay on there and then we're recording this and then I'm gonna put this probably onto YouTube and some other places. And um, most of you have not been edited yet. So we're still in the process of getting all of your interviews edited and, and posted. So I'm still in the process of doing that. I wanted to let you know, all know that. So I apologize, some of you have, some of you haven't, um, but I am working on that. <laughs> um, so I kind of want to start with, actually, I don't know who I want to start with, but I actually, Lucas and I had brought this subject up because I had spoken to um, another singer friend of mine who studied with a teacher that um, taught the use of vocal fry. And this is my first, this is the first thing that I wanted to bring up because singers have mostly been told, don't do it, right? Then I'm hearing that there's this new wave of you know, teachers that are saying, yeah, it's okay to do it when you get to the bottom of your range, that's where the bottom of your range is. And, and I, okay, so I see you all shaking your heads, no way, because that's where I, that's where I stand. That's exactly where I stand. Um, but I definitely want to hear, because Lucas and I had talked about it, I'm going to start with Lucas, and I want to hear your um, opinion slash expert, um, expert opinion, we'll say. Okay, so so in my opinion, I, I am not a proponent or supporter of vocal fry. Uh, Can you what vocal fry is first? I'm not quite sure what the question is. So vo vocal fry being that you're, you're um, tensing your vocal folds to the point where basically little uh, puffs of air are coming through, but kind of being forced through. So to kind of give a demonstration would be, uh, this so you're kind of fixing the vocal folds or the vocal cords in layman's terms uh and the musculature around it all the intrinsic muscles are kind of tense as a result so i don't think there's a whole lot 
that you're doing in terms of good vocal hygiene or good vocal health when you produce vocal fry. Uh, and often you'll hear sometimes famous actors and even singers who have either habitually or by choice decided or pathologically perhaps, you know, created this um, vocal fry in their speaking or even singing. Uh, now that can be used to great effect. Uh, someone like Louis Armstrong, you know, <laughs> what a wonderful world, you know, that kind of a growly sound and that became his signature, which was amazing. And we all recognize it. But I think that if, you are singing in different styles of music, specifically, let's say classical music or opera, which is my area of expertise. That's not something that you want in general to try to emulate because over time it's very fatiguing and it can even cause callousing of the vocal folds known as nodes or nodules. So I would tend to stay away from it. Um, I'd also be curious to see what the counter argument is, if anyone knows. Um, but as of yet, I haven't heard anything to suggest that it's uh, helpful or a optimal vocal health or hygiene. Yeah. So let's hear from Marcy, our other SLP in the group. Um, I'm I'm definitely of the the not vocal frying school too. Um, and <laughs> it's I think for me it's it's preventative as an SLP and just like your doctor, like we're not supposed to do stuff that's gonna harm you, you know? Now, if it was the only option for you to speak and communicate effectively, and that was the only way you could produce sound, okay, I might, I might ugh, consider it, but it wouldn't be my preference, not for a professional singer, not for a professional vocalist, because it's putting you at higher risk. It's higher risk for injury, higher risk for fatigue. And my whole job as a singing instructor and an SLP is to give you longevity and your ability to not only sing, but communicate. Let's just be real. Because once you start getting nodes and you start having injuries, you're not going to be able to communicate very well or have much stamina, even in your daily phone calls or your daily work. So as a medical professional and as an opera singer who's been trained to avoid such injury, I'm definitely not a proponent. Although I've started teaching at the Atlanta Institute of Music and Media. And let me tell you, it's a bunch of contemporary singers there. And so we've talked about that in class and they ask me, should I, shouldn't I, or I'll hear it in a warm up, and I'll say, no, I wouldn't suggest it. At the same time, if you're a pop singer and you're doing some Britney Spears, you better know how to do some of that vocal fry, man, or you're not gonna, <laughs> <laughs> you're not gonna be able to get the, get the gist of what she's putting out there. So you know, I'm, and I tell my class point blank, I'm, I'm definitely not the person to a teach you how to do it. Cause I can't even do it very well. Um, but I try not to, so that makes sense. And B, I'm not going to be the one that tells you to go around doing that as a habitual thing, because I'm also the person who's going to end up having to fix you when you break it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, um, I'm definitely more of a preventative on that, that front. And I am not a proponent for teaching vocal fry or using it with any, um, with any regularity. Do I have anybody here who is a proponent for the use of vocal fry or has an opinion maybe uh, about it in another way or, or has used it? I, I am not necessary for it. I have just been taught to do it. Um, so uh, mainly as just a warm up thing, like, the, like I would do some glottal pops and then uh, um, vocal fry. Um, and I've never thought about it as a negative thing really until now. <laughs> so, so, I mean, cause I don't do it for very long. We would only do it for, you know, maybe five to eight seconds, something like that. And then it would just be then going into sirens and kind of working your way up with your voice. But I, I'm gonna actually look into that more because I think that that's just something that I've kind of done because it was just what I did at college. Um, and so I've kept doing it. So that's, yeah, that's interesting. I'm, I'm glad it's come up. Yeah. Oh, wow. Jude, that, have, you, have you had any um, situations in which like that vocal fry makes the difference in your presentation that you, you need it to be there? Or is it, or is it a stylistic like director is chosen to tell you to do that? I'm just curious as to how it's being used pra pragmatically in 
your performances? Um, as far as it goes with performance, I haven't noticed anything. I haven't noticed any, you know, any positives or, or negatives really from it. Well, I don't know if I've noticed negatives. I might have, that might have affected things that I don't know, but, um, we, the, the type of singing technique that I learned is called a still. I don't know if that, do you know, is that a thing in, in the States? I'm not, I'm not sure, but it's called a still. Yeah. Yeah. I'm familiar with it. Yeah, and um, that was just one of the things that we that we did in a warm up. So I have no idea really how if if it does help my voice warm up or not. I've just always done it. So yeah, I'm gonna have to experiment a bit. I think. <laughs> I think yeah. maybe if you t if you're taking voice lessons, Jude, um, mm. or if you're studying right now, maybe bring it up with the teacher if you're you know thinking. Yeah. About lessons again and have that conversation you know find out what, what the meaning of that is for them and why what the purpose is I think it would be interesting mm -hmm. absolutely I, I mean I'm one of those that would say I mean if you're if you're able to do it and you aren't seeing any of those side effects or anything at this point I mean sparingly it's kind of like anything within reason but at the same time yeah. for me personally I would never I'm not I'm not going to try and warm somebody up that way that wouldn't be my tack and yeah. It doesn't mean that there isn't a rationale for it somewhere, but as an SLP, I just, it, I stay away from it because I'm afraid that I would end up hurting somebody or teaching them to hurt themselves. Or I totally, <laughs> I totally get you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to jump in here for a second and just say that vocal fry is, is so, hmm, it's such a dicey issue in the singing world. And while vocal fry is, can be grating on the chords, it can be just, you're just sitting on it and just uh, digging in. My teacher didn't use vocal fry, but used it air as a function from below to find where your vocal cords were, to find the least amount of pressure you could utilize to allow the vocal cords to come together. And with that comes a slight popping sensation that is not vocal fry, but can be misinterpreted as vocal fry if not used correctly. So there are, there are ways of utilizing it in a functional manner from air below the vocal cords that is safe and not grabbing and pulling and setting. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, but but that was only after having really understood where my chords were, how, how the functionality was managed by air pressure and frequency meeting and how those had to be in balance. And it was not until I understood those things and understood the acoustics of my own environment internally that we started talking about those things. Should it be used from the very beginning as a managing tool? No. <laughs> <laughs> because there are a lot of other things to to deal with and to understand before you get to that point yeah I I think what whenever we did it it was it was we were always told to be very gentle with it and it was like the time like it, it I think it basically was what you just said like it's so kind of gentle that it's it's like a popping um sensation kind of that could be mistaken for for, for fry yeah um, and I think, yeah, I think that's what it was. So, um, I think starting off with it is dangerous and c could be dangerous because if you don't understand kind of what you're doing or that you're pushing, you, you could be doing that. I think that was a really nice definition, Lexi, to, to kind of differentiate yeah. what, what you would describe as a, you know, bearing down and getting, mm -hmm. getting just straight up into that vocal fry versus using it as an, as an experimental, like airflow yes. kind of self-awareness and proprioception within the task. So, yeah. so yeah. And I love the way you just described it with proprioception, you know? Um, because that's you know, that's one of my favorite things to talk about is my integration and proprioception. <laughs> I love that subject. <laughs> it's amazing. And I, I'd actually um for Ben and Jude who've spent lots of time on cruise ships, um, I can rest assured I, I know what that feels like to have your proprioception off because when you're on a ship, you know, you're always moving. And so your body doesn't know where it is in space anymore. <laughs> so when you get on land, then you get your land legs, right? <laughs> 
I have sprained my ankles so many times <laughs> on ships and broken my foot on the contract I was on when Ben was with me. <laughs> um, and it was, you know, like that's, that's as a result of your body just not knowing where it is. And so where the way Marcy was just describing it was, you know, your, your, your under your natural understanding of what is happening here, you know, is proprioception. Sorry, we're nerding out, of course, <laughs> for sure. Um, I, I would not a problem. Speak. Yeah, Ben. Um, I work with a lot, I coach a lot of pop singers. And so what's interesting is, um, and I, and I've come across a couple of people who did use it in their warmups, which freaked me out at first. Cause I was just like, that's not something I've ever, would ever do in a warmup, <laughs> but the, and also because you're never going to use it for more than a split second. Like there are people who use it as a style to come into a phrase or to start, especially the beginning of a song where it's intimate or when you're recording a lot, because you can literally, it's just a tiny bit of sound you're utilizing. And so it's, um, uh, that makes sense to me because it's almost a reflection of, to me, when, when I work with singers and just coaching them, it has to come from the connection to the material. If you're just putting an affectation on to make a sound, it ultimately, it doesn't come across well or not mm -hmm. as well as something that would be coming from something. So, so to that end, it's used very little. And I almost never coach people to do it. What I would say is, um, I'm with you, Lexi. What I say is to um, find your, I, I call it soft focus so that your chords are still coming together, but you're not, they're not completely there so that everything is just no breath coming through. It's like, find where you can just let a little air come through so you still have easy onset. Um, that's how I do it if I'm singing pop music and it, it fits the style. But um, I don't know, it's interesting. I, I, I'm, I'd be curious to, to know people who do teach it as something that you do in a warm up, what, wh how they tell you to apply it. Because what I find is that people who have that sensibility generally use it pretty well and very sparingly. Um, yeah. But um, I've never heard someone try and sing, you know, eight bars of vocal fry. <laughs> um, so. Hopefully not. Yeah. Would Would you guys agree that vocal fry versus growling are very different things? Because there's, there's a technique to growl mm -hmm. versus a vocal fry. Because when you're growling and it happens organically, there's something very, a, a primal about a growl that is very open and spacious, not depressed and gripped. You have to have that space around it in order to get the direction of that. Ah. I, I would agree with that. And it's sort of like to my earlier comparison with Louis Armstrong, I think he was somebody who growled who didn't use vocal fry. Right. Uh, I think that you hear vocal fry more as a modern uh, thing or a contemporary thing and especially in a lot of actors I don't know why uh, and I remember taking my vocal um, pathology course when I was in um, my master's program for speech pathology and um, our professor talking about that and showing sort of the progression of certain actors that had um, basically incorporated vocal fry and habituated it and what happened to their voice over time and that was a really interesting thing so I would totally agree with you, Lexi. <laughs> yeah, not Alexandra, Lexi. Yeah. Lexi. <laughs> so does anybody have anything else to say about that? It's, it's kind of an interesting subject. And um, I think I learned about it first when I was getting my undergraduate degree in speech language pathology. And I thought, yeah, you know, a lot of people talk like that. And they, you know, they, and it's kind of a trend. It, and, you know, we talk about this in school in, in um, communication sciences and disorders where the way someone speaks and communicates is reflected in, in their social circle. So they learn and see, I just did it. I just did it just now, like slightly. I don't know if you heard me actually do it, but I just caught myself <laughs> doing it because of how we speak and we become, you know, we connect with our, our, our social circle in that way. And that's you know, something I never really considered before I, I studied it. And then I heard an article on uh, NPR about vocal fry and, and it was just a, and then hearing some teachers teaching that just kind of, you know, became a subject of, of curiosity. So I'm glad we were able to have a conversation about that. <laughs> so thank you for all your input. Even, so I was curious to know if you use it in recording. Who? Yes. Oh. 
Sorry, I was asking her if she she uses vocal fry herself in her recording. Yeah, so I think as I'm listening to all of you, I'm, I'm learning because I'm actually starting, um, vocal lessons this summer for the, for for consistently for the first time ever. And after doing this for eight years and just obviously due to COVID not performing as much, but pre COVID, I was doing four and five hour sets that were, you know, primarily pop music. And it was high energy and bars and in the hard rock and at the straw center in downtown Tampa. And, you know, it was a lot, but, um, so I will give myself the role of the alleyway mouse who has walked into the jazz bar and all of you are very educated. I'm the street perspective uh, for the room so because I have not as much education as all of you, but it's so interesting to hear about this and have names for techniques and things that I actually will do um, on stage. So I do use it during recording. It's more so for the emotional tenacities that it will kind of come into play. Like if we're talking something maybe a little more somber or something a little bit more upbeat, you know, I do it a lot when I talk, all of you are probably hearing it. <laughs> it is something that's a part of my voice. Um, but in a recording a lot, when we're talking into very high end mics and obviously, um, you know, wanting to get that emotional, um, that emotion kind of relayed into the saw into the story is definitely it's definitely used i use it a lot <laughs> probably too much <laughs> so um well i wouldn't say you use it too much necessarily because you know it, it, if, if your voice the way you speak you speak very eloquently i think um part of the habit you know mm -hmm. just maybe something you'll have to keep an eye on or listen to Mm -hmm. as you go, as you start taking lessons again, and, you know, maybe listening to everybody here speaking on the subject, it's absolutely a thing to, to consider. And it wasn't even something I necessarily considered. I just remember it being not good when I was in school and all of a sudden it's okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, and I really liked the way that Lexi had explained it. I don't know that I would say that I do vocal fry. So more so um, in the way that we're kind of, I, I will use my breath to, at the beginning of a phrase to kind of catch me there or, you know, at the break of something really, really sad. And um, that's, that's really kind of the way that I'll use it. I came across um, a young gal who is an Orlando artist and she does, I, I, there's a better word for it than, than screamo. That's, you know, whatever the actual word would be labeled as, but hearing her, what is essentially uh, for lack of better words, like screaming into the microphone. Now it is a genre, you know, she's definitely in her realm and um, it's her level of performance, but it, hurt me to kind of listen to and kind of hurt me as a singer to kind of think oh gosh I really hope she's doing that the right way because it just could I could just imagine the the pain that would probably come later um but it's definitely a style but the way that Lexi had kind of explained with that with that air push it's uh is more so the way that I would I would say that I use, I use yeah. it and that's which is what we call aspirating mm -hmm. there we go yep In that lower part of the voice especially mm -hmm. you know so um, yeah, great subject. Okay, so the only person that has not spoken so far, and I'm, I'm gonna talk to everybody, but Itai. <laughs> Itai, who is incredibly humble, by the way. Um, the man has been featured on BBC several times, um, his compositions and himself playing violin and his uh, compositions for the singers that he composes for his work has, I'm just going to brag on you. Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, his work has been performed at, um, Carnegie hall several times, right? Um, my goodness, you're a Juilliard master's degree. Uh, okay. I'm going to let you, I want you to brag about yourself a little bit. Get tied. Cause you're so, you're so humble. Well, thank you. Um, I, I just want to respond to everything I've been hearing yeah. um, because I was um, as I was listening to all this um, the the closest I can think about um, as a violinist um, is, uh, is basically analogous to um, let's say um, scratching right or, or, or a Ponticello and I think um, the idea of technique um, is uh, tools to express ourselves um, which also means choice so I think a choice should form a habit rather than habit forming choice. Um, so I think it's good to be able to, you know, as performers, I think we should have, um, we should aspire uh, to have an endless amount of sounds um, expressing life, 
Um, um, and, and as long as we know how to, to do it in a way um, that has meaning and adds um, and, and does not um, hurt us. And um, it also made me think a little bit. Um, one of the pieces I've written um, is a concerto for violin and soprano um, that includes hints of um, uh, some Celtic music and blues and a little bit of a Korean panzori. And the Korean panzori does include a lot of growling. Um, and uh, incidentally, I, um, I premiered it with um, Hila Plitman, who um, is a dear friend who won uh, the Classical Grammys a few days ago. Um, and um, it's interesting because um, it took me a, a long time to, to really um, try to incorporate all this to even to an orchestral sound. And um, I found that there's a difference between um, coming up with a technique that expresses something rather than using an easy habit um, that, that could become, um, um, as you say, a, a negative or prohibitive or just develop a, a bad habit. Yeah. But you... I'd like to hear more before I say anything else. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think we came kind of from a pretty uh, uh, knowledgeable panel here so far, so. I like what you had to say about um, making as, as many sounds as you can. And it's one of the things that I say to a lot of my singer students, I'm sure you all can relate to this. We, we take our voices, we are very personal with our voices. This instrument is very personal to us. But the truth is, is that if we were a guitarist, we would sit around trying to make every funny noise we could possibly imagine on that instrument and figure out how to do it and what it sounds like and how to get there and over and over again. And and it's one of the things I do encourage my singers to do is to experiment. The only way you're going to find out the, the boundaries of this instrument that you've been bestowed is to sit around experimenting with it. Make funny noises. Make fun of stuff you hear. See if you can do it. See what it does. And, <laughs> and get to know your instrument just like a guitarist would. They're sitting around trying to figure out how to make something sound like that you know, horse sound at the end of sleigh ride or, you know, and I'm sure a violinist does some of the same things. It's just to try and experiment with the instrument you have and your ability to command that instrument. And so I like that you mentioned that. And that's something that I definitely try to share with my singers as well. You know, I, I love that this became, you know, the, the theme of that, because it just made me think what you were talking about, Marcy, is experimenting with the voice and, and making all these. So I don't know if you've ever heard of a, a singer named Ema Sumac. Has anybody ever heard of Ema Sumac? Okay, she was South, America, South American singer um, who would go out into the woods when she was a little girl and she would just hear the birds and, and mimic the bird sounds that she heard. And, you know, she'd hear the roar of, of you know, maybe a, a panther or something, you know, whatever is in the, you know, Peruvian jungle <laughs> and mimic the sounds that she heard from like these low growls to these super high pitched and everything in between. And it's just a fascinating vocal instrument. It really is a fascinating instrument. If you haven't heard Ema Sumac, it's, it's very eclectic type music. You can find her on Spotify. I highly recommend um, that because she's somebody who, what you're saying, did all of these little things to try to mimic what she heard because it was so beautiful to her ears. So she wanted to sound like that. And she wasn't a trained singer. Not that I know of, not to begin with. Um, so anyway, yeah, I love that. And I love that we've, we've turned that vocal fry thing into a positive because it gives a lot of perspective. We have a lot of perspective on that now. I think we can simplify it in that it, we're called to play instruments. Yeah. Mm. We're called to play. Then that means just what a child does. It means have fun. It means enjoy. It means indulge. It, we are called to play for our living. Yeah. <laughs> That's really cool. Yeah. Really cool. <laughs> I love it. We all, did everybody just get chills from what she just said? What Lexi just yeah. said? <laughs> I just got chills. And it's so true. Oh my God. I just want to like excer excerpt that. I'm like, you know, put it out there <laughs> for everybody because it's true. We are. Oh my gosh. I got into music after uh, a four year competitive golf run in high school. And it was the first thing extracurricular that I had done that didn't feel like work, that felt like play. 
And I think that's what's kept us probably all involved in it is because at the core of it all, that is the fun of it. And I think for me, as untrained as I am and as, you know, just doing it for the, for truly the fun of it, um, Mm -hmm. that's really what's kept me, kept me there. Now I'm on the other side, like, oh shoot, I have to probably start doing some vocal lessons and some theory and (laughs) Um, we probably need to dive into the deep end a little bit more so that we can be a little better in these writers' rooms. Um, but I cannot agree more. I love that. Yeah. Well, I mean, we, you know, I remember I was going through your um, uh, interview, Eden, actually just the other day. And so we've just finished up the editing for your oh, interview. Nice. Yeah. So, um, and I was watching it and I was like, gosh, I remember like thinking how, how, you, you say you're untrained and you say how you're, you know, you want to start learning and that's great because, because to have those skills are excellent. It's, a, it's very important, but you know, we're, we're human animals and we were like what, what Lexi said, we were born to do this. We were born to sing. We were born to create and be creative beings. And that did not include a college degree. <laughs> not, Look, not even kind of. <laughs> experience is the greatest teacher. Mm-hmm. So you know, like as we all have gained our experience, we've learned things along the way and it doesn't matter what you do for a living, but that it's true. Experience is one of the greatest teachers. And so there comes a point where you can't claim that anymore because you'll have the experience that has, (laughs) right. Um, They say, what is it? What do they say? They say it takes five years to become an expert in something. Thousand hours. I love that. Thousand hours. (laughs) Thousand hours. Yep. (laughs) Also, sometimes education can be a hindrance to instinct. So yeah. don't forget that sometimes your education can, can get in the way and block your instincts. There's, there, there's that left brain, right, right brain thing, which I'm doing opposite because me, welcome. Um, but the, the, I know when I was a kid, I would sit down at the piano after my mom would, my mom is not a pianist very much, but she could sit down and play like for Elise or Rondo La Turca or some, some basic things. And as a kid, I would go, sit down at the piano and I would plunk out what she would play. And after being educated on how to read notes and rhythms and being told that was how you played music, I stopped thinking in terms of my ear until I became a singer again, until I really started paying attention because I went through a time of being a clarinetist and I was, that's what I thought I was gonna be. And I wanted to be sitting in the orchestra and doing the thing. But when I got on stage, I had to let go of that and really listen to everything around me. I, we, we have to listen and find the path between the harmonies. And it's so much more than just education. There is so much instinct and so much soul involved in what we do. So don't, do not say you're untrained. (laughs) Do not, please. (laughs) No, I appreciate that because, so I, I, when I had first started uh, playing guitar and I taught myself, you know, the, I taught myself three chords and sat in my bedroom and was just playing with them. And um, I went to a guitar lesson and I wasn't playing with a pick. It was uncomfortable. I didn't like it. I liked playing with the, my capo a certain way. And I went into this first lesson and it, I got angry. I got upset because he told me I had to play with a pick and I had to start tuning it differently and doing this and doing that. And um, I walked out and I'm like, I shouldn't be angry. And I was like looking up at the clouds and I'm like, dang it, Eden. Like, why did you, why are you upset? This is important. And I never, I didn't go back. And I, to this day, you know, seven years later, I, I still don't really play with a pick. I kind of bounce with my thumb and that's just how I just will enjoy it. And, um, it's helped in my songwriting. It's, it's allowed me to create my, my artistry in in a certain type of way. And when I work with guitar players, like, wait, how are you doing that? Wait, how do I, you know, and it, it, it keeps it interesting, keeps it fun. And, um, so yeah, I guess, I guess in a way it is kind of, I get, I don't know, street education. I don't know, but (laughs) you know, I think that moving forward, you know, learning that theory, but I appreciate that. So thank you. (laughs) You mean you're a unique individual who has their own life? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) So that's good perspective though. I think for any artist who, who fall, who falls into the viewers of, of watching this, it'll be, it's, it's awesome to kind of allow us to have this balance in this room and have that kind of conversation because you know, I would benefit from watching this myself and being like, oh, hey, okay, that's, 
that's not a bad thing. That's really awesome actually. And, um, it only allows us to grow, you know, can only go up. (laughs) We all start somewhere, you know, we don't, we're not born knowing everything. (laughs) So, you know, we're not always an expert right out of the gate. There might be good, some things that we're naturally good at, you know, we'll take two, but you know, it takes work. It takes work and, and a lot of perseverance. So, so good on you for, for keeping that going. So, so I want to um, talk to Ben a little bit about what's going on in the industry right now. I'm starting to see some of my friends going back to the ships, <laughs> like just going back. Um, so what, what in the process are you right now? If you're allowed to talk to about that, I don't know. You can say no. I can just tell you what I know, which yeah. is, you know, I don't have all of the future plans of Royal Caribbean and all the cruise lines in my back pocket. But mm-hmm. I will say definitely, um, well, Royal Caribbean has had a ship in Singapore in service since December, and it's been very mm-hmm. successful. Um, only Singaporeans are allowed on board and they're doing it all with testing. So they have to be tested before they get on. They're tested while they're on the cruise. It's only three or four day cruises and they don't go anywhere. They just go to sea. Um, and uh, then before they get off the ship, they have to be rapid tested as well. So that the, if for some reason someone did get COVID, they wouldn't be bringing it back into the country. Uh, but it's all been fine. They had a little scare early on, but it was a false positive. It's an elderly man. He was ill. They gave him a test. It said positive. And then, you know, they did all their protocols and then they did another one to just double check. And then it was negative and they realized he was negative. Um, Royal has a new ship that's coming out um, that was delayed from last year and it will be... Uh, coming out of Israel. It'll be the first time Royal Caribbean's ever made a home port in Israel. And the reason is, is that Israel has successfully vaccinated most of their adult population. So this will be an all vaccinated cruise. So the only people who are able to go on are Israelis who are vaccinated. Again, it will go only, actually they will go to sea and they'll go to um, a couple Greek islands. I want to say Corfu and one other one. I can't remember the other one, but um, so, but again, it's just Israelis that can get on the ship. Um, and they have to be vaccinated. Um, I think if that goes very well, that'll start in May sometime is when the actual ship goes into service. If that goes well, then I'm sure they will start to do that in Miami because there are, I'm sure there are hundreds of thousands of you know, retirees who are ready to go. They're like, I have my vaccinations, I'm ready to go. So I think that, that we'll see that happen. Pro- I would guess sometime June or July, they'll start to have a ship or two come out. And then then it just depends on what happens. If that all goes well and, and everything is moving forward, they'll keep adding more and more ships back. Royal has uh, 25 ships. So, you know, it could take till next year for some of them to all come out, depending on how everything goes and the worldwide um, situation. Because as those of us who've been on ships know, mo- very few Americans work on the ships. It would be a few of the performers, a few of maybe people in the shops or the spa or something that's it the the people who are you know the engineers and the captains and the crew members are not from the united states so it's very dependent on getting people from around the world who are able to a travel to wherever the ship is and that their country will release them or if they go they can come back um so that's going to be that's one of the things that's hard about the industry is it really is a worldwide industry so we'll see. We'll see. I, I, my my prediction is there will be limited cruising starting in the summertime, and I don't think anything resembling kind of the full scale cruising will happen until 2022. That's my guess. Yeah, when everything is pretty settled with the vaccine, and I know in Florida they've just lowered the age to 60. So um, they're talking about, I think federally, like the president had. Um, announced by May 1st, he wanted to have all, everybody vaccinated. And no, make it available to everyone. Available to yeah, everybody. By May 1st, everyone, there would no longer be age restrictions. Yeah. Right. Here in Georgia, it's 55. So oh, wow. just about there, but. I know, I know. Huh, Lexi? Artists, uh, artists in New York, if you work for a nonprofit in, or the theater world in New York City, you are now eligible to get your vaccine. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> That's so good. Helpful. Yeah. <laughs> we need it here in Florida because we have a, a big, you know, performance based like Disney and Bush Gardens and Universal Studios. And of course, all of the, you know, the, the, we have a, a lot of, um, uh, well, television and movies and, and 
commercials and infomercials, things like that. We have a lot of that industry here. Um, so we need to get on the ball with it. So we're all, we're all hopeful, I know. I know all of us in, in, that are sitting right here in this virtual space are definitely looking forward to that. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I actually just did my first gig since last March. I did that three weeks ago. So it was almost a year to the day that I did a gig and it was an outdoor gig and it was all opera <laughs> and it was a 45 minute gig um, you know, where I kind of was standing in this space by myself, socially distanced from everybody. Um, and it was really, really great. <laughs> it felt I, so good. I think there are a lot of performers who are hopeful for this season, mm -hmm. <laughs> for this performance season. Um, even I've started to kind of work up a duo and see if we can maybe tiptoe out into the world a little bit. So, um, so I, I get it. I think there are a lot of people that, and, I'll be real with you guys. Like I didn't realize how much I was missing live music until I started teaching at the Atlanta Institute of Music and Media. No one else in the world right now is getting to go and see live music with a live band on stage with the lights and the whole bit. And I get to see it every week. And I'm just like, I am so blessed and it's amazing. <laughs> and so, um, so yeah, it makes you, when we start getting back to it, I think we're all going to realize how much we really missed it and how that's really been impacting us, not only uh, financially, but um, just physically and emotionally. I mean, it's such a sensory thing to go to a live performance and just have the music hit your body. It's, yes. it's something that I remember the first day I got to sit in to the concert, you know, the little performance class that they have, they have a full band on stage, students and faculty, and, um, we're all masked, everybody's distanced, you know, um, they even have like plastic cubicles where the singers go. <laughs> like, so they're doing what they can to do it. But I just remember coming out of there, like feeling just a wash of energy that I was like, man, I haven't had this for over a year. So I think it's going to be, I think a lot of people are really hopeful for this performance season. And I'm really looking forward to seeing how we can integrate live music back into the world. I think it's going to help with everybody's, you know, cabin fever and depression and anxiety about everything that's been going on. So. Mental health, that thing, you know, we need, we need live art. Actually, um, so Dr. James Bass, who is one of our panelists who's not here, gee, I wonder why he just won a Grammy, by the way. Um, so he's probably celebrating and having all kinds of things going on, but he, we actually talked about that. He was one of my first interviewees and, um, you know, he's the choral director and artistic director of uh, uh, Long Beach Camerata Singers and at UCLA. So he, he teaches there and, um, and he actually has, has been performing with a core group from the Camerata Singers out there. And he started this thing called the Front Porch Series. So if you watched his interview, try to watch part of his interview, it's on YouTube. Um, and it's fascinating. He actually made more money during COVID than he has in past seasons with his group. So people would come, but he's in California. So of course it's, you know, weather-based. You can't really do that every single day of the year in Florida or New York. In LA, you can. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but he said that that it was just so successful. People would come out and you know they do the socially distanced thing, singing, and people would sit socially distanced in their lawn chairs and just watch this concert, this choral con beautiful concert. And um, you know, so so they've been very blessed out there, and I, I I would love to see more of something like that happening in in the future, even with. Um, all the ideas and all the things that that we've kind of had to come up with to manage our own careers during COVID, um, we've had to get really creative, some of us, you know, um, and that's how he got creative and it, and it turned out to be pretty successful and that's probably going to be an ongoing thing after everyone's out of this whole pandemic. <laughs> so um, what have you all done in terms of creating something different from your from pre-COVID times to now. Anybody have anything that they want to talk about in that capacity? I, I would like to, oh, sorry, I didn't want to yeah. jump in anyway. Um, I would like to sort of um, just briefly touch on on, um, on something which I think we, we all know, but maybe should um, re-articulate to ourselves. Um, and, um, you know, most of my life and most of my work um, is a performer and like everybody else, I miss performing live, I miss performing with big groups, orchestras in front of large audiences. But at the same time, um, 
I suppose the last year um, has really given me a chance to reevaluate about what it's like to not be seen as an essential worker um, and think about how um, what is essential and helpful about what I'm doing. Um, so um, I have been um, composing and practicing and um, developing projects for the future, but one of the things I've been doing is um, developing therapies um, for hospital and clinics. And one of those things um, is um, providing music uh, for uh, speech therapy with Lucas. Um, and, I, and I mentioned that because um, I think we kind of, we tend to sort of forget the other side. You know, why is music so important to people who are not musicians? You know, we, we, we wouldn't have a profession without them. Um, what is it that can really be gained? And, and um, it really is, um, it's, it's, um, it really is essential. And I think we, we, we've been given a chance to um, reframe and explain and see what life is like without this. Um, so um, hopefully we won't experience anything like that pandemic again, but we don't know what life is going to bring. And I think that um, having music and music in a targeted way um, is absolutely crucial. So I think we, we all need to think about um, how do we communicate that uh, to people outside our profession. I would really love to hear Lucas. Yeah, what you guys are doing. I was going to see if I can dovetail on that. Absolutely. So I couldn't agree more. And I'm so grateful to Itai that he has uh, included me in this incredible project uh, of using basically sequences that he has composed to help um, both uh, rehabilitate and optimize vocal resonance with. Uh, with with anybody it's not just professional singers and i worked on um this a little bit with uh one of my clients uh, to really good results um unfortunately because of covid everything got a little curtailed <laughs> so uh, but i'm hopeful that i will have the opportunity to do that again as i grow my private practice um so essentially what Itai has done is, is, well, he has several sequences, but, but the one that I used, something that is um, very uh, note-wise related to folk music, if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, Itai, but I believe that's, that's uh, what we had discussed, and the fact that it, it connects with uh, a very visceral uh, musical sense that is in all of us, and I think speaks to the power of binding music and the human experience and dare I say the soul <laughs> and that in my mind speaks to the incredible healing power for what all of us who have performed have been able to do and communicate and felt during our performances but also something that can be very intimate and personal and healing in an everyday, practical, pragmatic application. And so that's what these sequences that Nitai has developed do. Uh, and the wonderful thing is that, you know, we all know that when you put words or, you know, into a musical phrase, you can shape it in different ways. And the musical phrase acts as a vehicle for that expression. So what we did was we would take, you know, what I did in the in the therapy was I would take uh, uh, one of these melodic sequences and then put different phrases, um, things that could be, you know, from the mundane to, you know, a great expression of, of interest or passion and see how that would shape the dynamic range or the resonance and uh, allow the client to find a means of, of of expression in different ways. And to, and to come back to what Lexi said, it also to play. Um, and all of that allowed this client to, um, to maximize and optimize a vocal resonance and also find um, a new means of expressing um, themselves. So anyway, that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> I mean, it sounds, yeah. it, it, uh, there's a little bit of a musical intonation type style to this, but it sounds like you're helping like a voice. This is a voice client. No, not. 
Okay. Someone who was having difficulty in a professional setting, I'll say uh, for confidentiality, confidentiality reasons, can't give you the name, but uh, a, a woman, a female who didn't, who was being talked over. Ah, oh, she needed presence. Yes. Yes. That's very cool, you guys. Yeah. I would love to hear more about this and maybe even bring it out. <laughs> yeah. That's I need to put you in touch with one of my students who's just started a corporate um, company where she's taking the techniques that we've been using uh, as, um, as singers and utilizing them to empower and to reframe tonality for corporate clients. And that's, a, it sounds a lot like what she's trying to do with it, what she's doing as well and utilizing it to say, you make, you don't know that you're coming across as aggressive, but let's change your intonation of your phrasing and change this so you understand how that function. And she has, and I'm very proud of her. She's, she has a huge studio and she works with transgender, um, uh, a lot of transgender clients as well. And it's really exciting to watch her develop a, basically a, a very similar idea of what you're, it, 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 this is so needed. It's so needed because yeah, of I think that's the key, the key word here, you know, that we, that we tend to take for granted and, and maybe not think quite enough about how to explain. Um, and and um, I think that, um, you know, when it's all gonna be over or managed, um, we should be very happy and thrilled to go back to performing, but we, should, we shouldn't forget that if we don't make an effort to involve and engage, um, something we don't want is gonna happen again. Um, and um, uh, I think it's really sort of uh, engagement in a targeted way. Uh, they can, it can just make a huge difference in so many levels for so many people. Wow, well, yeah. Beautiful. You know, um, I, I wanted to have this be like one hour. We, I'm sure we can talk about everything in an hour and I know that that can't happen, not with this group and um, you know, but I do want to say Lexi, I find it fascinating. You're talking about somebody who works with transgender and what kind of work you have to do in order to build that confidence up in their voice as it changes. And um, you know, so many facets and so many things that you'd have to think about that I, I didn't think about until you just said that just now, you know? So that's fascinating. And I wonder if Lucas and Marcy um, have worked with people in, in the transgender group? I have not, uh, but I have attended grand rounds um, for vocal pathology and um, voice therapy, where that is definitely um, an area of growing need and interest in the wor world of um, voice therapy. So absolutely. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's fascinating. It's certainly fascinating. I don't know a whole lot about it specifically, but I know that's something that's a, that's a hot topic. Um, but also coming back to sort of this need, uh, there was actually a big article in the ASHA um, publication, ASHA Journal, uh, which is the American Speech and Hearing Association. Uh, and they were talking about in particular um, maximizing resonance and uh, the use of one's voice without pushing. <laughs> uh in an everyday use and again you know um sorry to embarrass you itai but to bring up your sequences it's a wonderful vehicle uh to help someone explore that wow yeah. okay that's great yeah fantastic the more research and the more the more evidence that we have whether it's case study or um or empirical evidence that we have that music is effective. And I mean, we've got a whole nother area of therapy, music therapy that, um, you know, people like me and Lucas have to be careful not to step our toes too far in because we're not technically, but anyway. Um, but I, I can't tell you, I mean, I work with babies, so I don't deal with the transgender population. However, um, I do deal with um, parents who are, you know, petrified as to how they're gonna communicate with their child. And one of the first things that we do with all toddlers, I don't care if they're delayed or not, is sing. It's one of the first things we do. I use my singing voice in every appointment almost. I even have my piano sitting here and I end up playing piano for these kids. So we end up doing wheels on the bus and twinkle, take a little star over and over. And that's just part of how they uh, you know, get speech and communication going, which let's be real. If you can't communicate with your child, if you can't communicate with your family, 
what kind of life is that? What kind of quality of life is that? Mm-hmm. And music is part of communication. It's an extension. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a reason that the front singer seems to be the most famous a lot of the time, and that's because they're communicating. You know, they're, it's that thing that people relate to. So, you know, um, as far as the actual words, the, the phrases, the, the language itself. So I don't know, I'm, I'm with you. And I think it's wonderful that you guys are working together on that. Like I said, please send me information. I'll be happy to help share it and, and gather data for you or whatever you want. That sounds like a great Thank idea. Thank you. Yeah, that's amazing. So Ben, I wanted to ask you, so I want to kind of go back to the, um, the role. We've talked a little bit about this, um, the role of transgender in casting. So I know that, um, you know, we were talking about vocally how the changes happen. What, uh, what have you seen in casting in terms of vocal change or it, is, it, is, is it a moot point? I mean, is it something that's just, they're amazing, we want to cast them or they're not good singers and we don't or what, what is your take on that? Well, I would say um, this is more particularly related to Broadway than cruise ships. Mm-hmm. Um, and in Broadway, what I've seen before, coming into 2020 and then of course everything got shut down was an openness to reimagine traditional musical theater roles so that it's no longer, you know, leading man, leading woman, ingenue, male and female ingenues and the character and, you know, to just let it be human beings and whatever, whether it's an old piece of theater, musical theater that people are looking to make relevant to today I've seen interest in that in changing the, you know, obviously hairspray kind of put that in everyone's face that, Hey, you can do a show successfully and add this element. That's not even part of the show and make it, you know, it makes people understand things in a different way and makes them think about humanity in a different way. But I will say for the first time ever, end of 2019, um, I worked closely with Duncan Stewart of Stuart Whitley casting in New York and they were actively casting um, two things that I had not seen up in that point in my career. I mean, there might've been some things in regional theater, but for Broadway things, um, differently abled. So they wanted people who were totally, you know, real human beings who were actors and there are those actors. They're just not utilized very much. And so this playwright was looking for differently abled people. And um, what was interesting is they really realized how the channels of how people get into their rooms are so already, well, we all know it's, it's, it isn't a very diverse channel that gets you into a Broadway casting director's office. So um, that's something they really learned. They had to go outside of the box. Um, They went to a lot of schools around the country that have great training programs that are training people of every type. And that includes transgender Um, going into 2020 at the beginning. That was another thing. um, They were also, actively looking for a couple of projects that they the creators and or i should say the producers were looking for um to to cast transgender just to give it another dimension to to see what and also really to see what actors were out there what kind of and really it was about the people they were casting if if depending on who they saw they might take a role in one direction or make it take it in another and that's something that i would say and you know you know i was on Broadway, you know, 25 years ago, and I've stayed current with a lot of that stuff. It, that just was not happening in those days. So that whole thing has really been opened up a lot. And it's very, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by the fact that that will be something maybe that will go into training programs of, okay, if you're transgendered, here's some things that you can do with your voice. Here are some training that, that you can take to expand your range into the place that you want to go into. Um, so yeah, it's very exciting. I, I think the thing for me that's interesting, and I think all of us, it's almost like we've just had a, comp- the world has had a complete reset. Um, a lot of things will go back to habitual things, I'm sure, but I think many things people are gonna be open to, just like we've spoken about, wanting to just see any kind of live theater. We wanna see, you know, people will wanna see the old familiar, but they also will want to see truth about you know, that's, I think, something we've all been through this year is, um, yes, there's escapism, but going forward, let's make things mean something, really. I think that's kind of a theme I'm seeing in just most people's lives. You know, it's like, we've got to make this count. Why why just do some peddly things or we're not going to put up with these things that were happening? You know, it's not, I think, a mistake that we're seeing a lot of um, 
just inappropriate actions come to the surface that people are now just saying, we're not going to tolerate this anymore. Why should we? If we're going to come back and, and I'll go back to our real lives, let's do it in a way where we can all really thrive together. But yeah, so there's exciting things. Who, I don't know where that's going to go, but I will say that's a big change I saw in the last really year and a half to two years, the openness. I'm looking forward to hearing more about that in the coming, you know, post COVID era too, to see where things happen and occur there for um, more singers. Because I think this, this year we, you know, we've really, maybe people who haven't been singers professionally have really probably tapped into their creativity during this last year um, and found a voice and found something that uh, maybe they didn't think they had before. And now they've, they have a different kind of confidence level because they've tapped into it over this year, just in their own rooms, you know, just in their own bathrooms and their showers, or maybe they have sat down with a guitar because they had more time and um, started creating more and felt more confident because of that. So I am really looking forward to hearing um, how things go with you, Ben, and everybody really, you know, over the next um, three to six months and a year and 10 years and um, how it's all going to shift and change um, as we, as our mind mindsets have shifted and changed, you know, um, you know, and I'm looking forward to, to seeing um, one of the things that I keep thinking about is we've been so concerned about our physical health, you know, because of COVID. Physical health has been at the top most concern, you know, um, globally. Um, but one of the things like we've said was mental health has suffered because of it. And part of that is because we haven't had art, because we haven't had an outlet. Um, so, you know, it's like a choice, physical health, mental health. But now we've shed some light on that mental health. And I think all of us can agree that music and singing and performing and just being an artist because we're human, because that's part of who we are as a human being helps conquer that mental health issue too so i think that too we've the mental health is affected because we just don't have each other i mean right. part of getting together to play music or create art in any way is the camaraderie and being in a room with other people with other human beings and at this point how many of you can say that you've even had that elbow brush when someone walked by you a little too close it's been a long time since <laughs> i felt that so just to be in your own home. And if you don't have, you know, someone there to give you a hug, like you're missing that. You're missing that. So I think that that's a piece of it, but I think that that, that art piece, it, there's a, several layers to that. That's an onion that we could peel forever because it's not just the music or the art or whatever. It's the people, it's the group, it's the discussion, it's the creation. It's all the stuff that kind of goes with that onion. So um, I agree with you. It'll be interesting to see how we try to quote unquote return to normal. Um, and there's there's a little bit of me that hopes we don't go back to normal. I want something new. I want something better. So yeah. I'm hoping that we all take this moment and think to ourselves, what are our priorities? I think this is that reevaluation time. And hopefully as we come back, we'll start to prioritize things that maybe we're starting to get pushed a little too far back on that burner. <laughs> Well, last time there was a global pandemic that it was the bubonic plague and therefore the renaissance came out and we i i have been saying this since the very beginning a plague brings renaissance this is a renaissance time this is a time when we are going to find new new work new birth new art new formats it's just as hard as the, it is sometimes even as kids, we know that, that growing hurts. They're called growing pains for a reason. Um, when we're knitting together the next level of society, it's so much more than just um, getting through. This is, it, this is a global growth period and it's exciting. It's, it's terrifying, it's exhausting um, and it is, very special to be an artist in the midst of all of this. Um, for the past year, I don't, I, I don't understand how or why, but I have been privileged enough to, to be part of about five different productions in the past year. And I, between 
one being my own company doing a live stream of Hansel and Gretel. And I didn't really want to be part of it, but I was there because we needed a body. So I sang uh, The Mother and Hansel and Gretel. And then in the fall, I, I had I was privileged to go to Seattle and sing Cavalleria Rusticana that they were doing for their, their digital season. And then I, I was in Michigan for the, the drive through Wagner, Twilight, Twilight Gods that's coming to Lyric in, in the spring. I'm doing that here. And I just finished doing a brand new opera. Who knew that my opportunity to sing in a brand new workshop experience of an opera would come during a pandemic. <laughs> and here I am having just finished filming this workshop of the puppy episode, which is an opera based on Ellen DeGeneres when she came out on uh, on, her, on the Ellen show and a, 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 a fictionalized version of, of people's reaction to that event. And it's, it's about family, it's about the life experience and to have those opportunities and see these things growing and flourishing in the midst of, let's face it, insanity. This year has been insane, is an honor and it is so humbling to see you all on this panel talking about how beautiful art is and how beautiful this life is that we are privileged to be part of. And I am humbled and honored so much and so deeply to see and to meet all of you. And it means so much. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. Goodness. Well, thank you all for being here. You guys are all amazing. I can't, I'm, I can't, I'm humbled that all I did was just like kind of ask you guys, would you want to do a little interview? <laughs> I was so nervous to ask everyone, every single person here. And Itai was the first person I, I was like, Itai, can I experiment on you? I've never done this before and I really want to. Would you want to do this with me? And it just kind of flourished from there. And I got to thank you all for just being so amazing at what you already do, but then also having your input and then, you know, collaborating with this thing that, you know, could maybe at some point take a life of its own. I don't know. I want you to share this with your people and, you know, can, you know network with each other. And um, this is how we keep music alive. This is how we do it, you know? This is how we have to do it. We've got to come together and have these conversations and feel good about it. Because I think a lot of times, like me personally, I mean, I took on a, a regular old J-O-B. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm working for an architecture and design firm. And I, this is my first job, like that doesn't have anything to do with music in 20 years. First job. Hey, you got to eat. <laughs> right. Exactly. You know, and, and, and honestly, though, like people like me are saying, what am I gonna? What am I gonna do? I need to be encouraged, and here we are encouraging each other. Mm -hmm. You know, and we have to do that. We have to keep doing that. I played my so. first, um, kind of my first show back in January, right after the New Year, and uh, my same show that I was playing pre-COVID outdoor show and outside the Straw Center alongside River Walk. It's like this beautiful long, um, just sidewalk along the river outside in downtown Tampa. And usually we see about, you know, three to 10 people sitting in the chairs, eating and having a drink. And this particular night, I mean, we had about 50 people just watching and I played a three and a half hour set and, you know, those sets kind of rotate after a while, you know, when you play that long and your, your crowd kind of rotates and I had tips like that I had not seen and which is great after COVID, but you know, when I, every time I took my break and I came off stage, there was such great conversation, not just about the music that was being played, but just about life. And I think that that in and of itself is just showing us, I think personally, how many people are so hungry for art. They're so hungry for performance and so in a different way, kind of almost more appreciative of it from an audience's perspective and not seeing so many cell phones not seeing so many, you know, magazine flippings or whatever might, might kind of distract people or even conversation, just listening to the stories about songs, listening to the dialogue that's happening on the stage. And for us performers, I think that that's just so refreshing. I think that that, that just that hunger for, um, 
for performance is, is really, and not just to give the performance, but to then have that conversation and to listen and watch like Corinne, like what you were just saying about, you know, having that J-O-B and really wanting to have that, that Friday night watching a show outside or going to the theater is going to be so much more enjoyable and a different perspective. So I'm ready for it. We all are. <laughs> Absolutely. My goodness. So I know that Jude is the latest out of everybody here. She's uh, pushing 1220 at her, <laughs> on her time. So <laughs> all good. You... Uh, I've got time to get out for tomorrow. So, oh, perfect. So let's stay on until one o'clock her time. Just kidding. COVID. <laughs> <laughs> so I would love it if anybody had anything else to add um, or anything in particular that they wanted to ask or talk about um, while we have everybody on here um, and before Jude has to, you know, turn into a pumpkin. Or... <laughs> <laughs> so, I would actually love uh, to know, um, Ben, I would actually love to know for you, obviously with the cruises kind of stopped at this time and there's only a few going how are, how is the, the corporation like handling all of that talent that they previously managed and, you know, going back in, I can only imagine as a casting director, you're just kind of like, at the same time, the world is your oyster of talent. Like you can just, <laughs> you can create anything you want at this point. So tell me a little bit about like how you guys are, are looking ahead to plan for that need for talent when it does open. Well, yeah, it's, I mean, Royal Caribbean before the pandemic hired about 1800 performers a year. Um, so it's a big operation. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, 26 theaters, there's no, no, no other performing entity that hires and utilizes is even more than Cirque du Soleil. So it's a big operation and to shut it down all at once was crazy. People didn't get home right away, but the, the big, they've done many things in their time, um, the, those who are still down there in the office, um, they've built an entire new casting system. It's basically an online, almost like a Facebook kind of idea where anyone who wants to submit now can create a profile. And then, especially now they have the time to do this um, with their smaller staff that's there, can review all the videos. And I think that's something I'll be starting to do in from home coming not too long from now but just reviewing all the submissions and then categorizing them into where we kind of could see them. Also people who have already worked for the company, it categorizes them. So as the jobs come open, they can look at who is, who has done that contract before. Oh, so-and-so great. Let's make, give them an offer because now that ship's going back out. So they'll first offer people who, who were on ships when they were all shut down um, and then open it up and, and and some of those people have taken other jobs some of them have gotten married some have had children you know things life is happening so some of those people won't be available but those who are still available who it still makes sense they'll they'll offer it back to them um but yeah it's it, casting will be very different i don't see us you know i used to be on the road 250 days a year going to new york la australia new zealand south africa france italy you know i mean all over um, and so I don't think, I don't see that happening this year. This will all be online submission. And I see that also for New York. Um, most of what's going to happen in the next nine months will be all online submission kind of things. Maybe for New York, if they're new people they haven't worked with, they'll, they'll maybe have like one last in-person um, uh, audition. But yeah, so it's going to be a lot about this kind of thing. The video online uh, recording and submission is huge. And that's one thing that I've been doing all this pandemic is I just started coaching online. I, I always kept saying, oh, I should be, you know, cause I would get requests a lot. And I just, with my travel schedule and with my life, I just didn't want to commit to it. But now it's like, I've got the time, so let me do it. And that's opened up a really amazing group of people that I would maybe not work with because of the cruise industry. There's, I know people everywhere. And so, you know, there's people I'm coaching from Australia and people in England and people all over the U S and, you know, someone who used to be a dancer at Royal Caribbean years ago is now an agent in Canada, a big agent. And they have a, someone who's a TV person there who wanted to work on their voice for some up and coming projects. So I've been working with that person. And so it's just interesting. Like, so it's opened up some great, I mean, I have to say, considering, you know, I've been able to do it from home. That's been amazing. Um, and I think, you know, for the cruise industry, um, they now can reinvent themselves again. Um, and, uh, I, and they will. I think a lot of it is, you know, 
when you're running such a big operation, it becomes a huge factory. And now they've had the luxury of really going through things and go, okay, this was not working. Let's revamp that. Okay, that, oh, there's a problem there. Let's fix that. You know, different things. They've, they're, I don't think they'll be changing the shows right away, but because things will be coming in, you know, a few at a time, they'll be able to tweak some things in a way that they wouldn't when you have all these things running at one time. So yeah, it's, it's, it's been, I mean, I can't even imagine, you know, I think obviously they're big companies and they have, you know, I mean, just their vessels alone are worth billions of dollars. So they have capital they can access. Um, so it's not like they're going to go under, but it is, you know, they've had, they've cut a lot of jobs and um, all those performers and all those crew members from around the hundreds of thousands of crew members um, who, for whom that money, you know, may, gave them a living, their parents a living, depending on countries they're from. So that has been a devastation to the worldwide economy and in many countries abroad. So, you know, I know it'll be, you know, it'll be very welcome when it comes back. Um, and, uh, but yeah, thank you for asking. It's, it's, no, I think it's, they're, they're definitely reinventing. I think it's very interesting that even even the cruise ship casting is going online. Like everything has gone virtual. It's it's really fascinating. And you're right. I think it's gonna give so many industries a chance to revamp. And Lexi, that made me think of you. And I was like, well, here's Lexi doing all this production. Here's a bunch of performers that need to audition. <laughs> oh, I don't know. There might be something in it for you. <laughs> Well, Ben, you definitely have a lot of people here that, you know, will, will jump on the opportunity when it comes. <laughs> yeah, sure. So look out. <laughs> but this is a great way. I mean, I think like Ben, you were talking about, um, you know, a dancer who has become an agent in Canada and, you know, you have Marcy and Lucas and Itai and, you know, these people who are doing so many things that are um, so beneficial for singers and performers in general that, um, you know, definitely, definitely reach out to each other through this, because I think that you'll all be, um, you know, very good for each other. <laughs> One of my very, very best friends who I went to undergrad with, she has taken this COVID time to, she's a performer, she was a voiceover artist for years, but her kids are growing up and she is now getting her master's to be an SLP. So I've been following her journey going through that. So I can't wait to tell her, oh, I've met some people you need to network with because she was a singer and a performer and when she was young. And, um, but she's, I mean, she started it be just before they had to um, be, you know, sequestered, but she said, it's been amazing. And even that's revamping because imagine, imagine you're now doing some of your first assessments on a video and, you know, she has now done some in person and there, especially with the young ones there still in person but um yeah it's just it's it's everything is just changing and you know i think in some ways it's brought like all of us to get all of us in one place together physically would almost be impossible or not likely to happen but this we could do this twice a year and we know you know it'd be super easy to do that make that happen so i think learning that aspect of of that we can actually be a lot closer than we think um, because of the pandemic has been, I think that's been a saving grace for me personally. And um, I've connected and stayed connected with a lot more people that I'm, I've had the luxury of traveling a lot of places and seeing people once, twice a year. But now it's some of those people I, you know, do this maybe once or twice a month. So yeah, it's good. That's awesome. I know. And I was thinking, you know, with when you can have that kind of connection and it is so easy to get, like you can collaborate with other business owners, with other creatives with other people in a way that even is just supportive for your own work in your own neighborhood, even, you know, and that, and two, there's something beneficial about that because I can talk to somebody who's in California, we could have a similar business idea, share ideas, help each other grow, but we're not, we're not competition necessarily exactly. for yeah. each other, or we can collaborate. You know, we have an SLP in New York working with a violinist. Let's see if we can, you know, bring their program and make it grow. So it's, there's all of that. And by the way, if your SLP friend wants to talk, I love talking about it. So Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank give you. Her, give her my uh, information if you like. <laughs> That's Good how Marcy and I know each other. That we is actually, how we know each other. Oh, no, nobody here knows him. Um, Bruce Meadows. Bruce Meadows was also on cruise ships and we worked together. We worked on Princess. Yes, he was. Yeah. And Bruce introduced Marcy and me. Marcy was coming down to USF where I live in Tampa to, to get her SLP masters and I was testing the waters with SLP myself. I was getting my like uh, 
what is it called? The, the seven classes that you take just to kind of- Your prereq. You were prerequisites, the prereqs. Yeah. And I ended up going for the entire degree instead, <laughs> but I never went for the master's. So I can't call myself anything. <laughs> and Bruce and I met when I was doing, I did Music Man and did a tour with, of Music Man with um, oh, Theater, of the, Theater of the Stars or something like that. I don't know, it was based on Elena. You probably know it, Ben. Um, but yeah, I met him. And then when I decided to do SLP, he was like, hey, I have a friend in Tampa. So, you know, and here we are. We're all and here. ironically, I did the tour of Music Man, the first national tour of Music Man out of New York. There you go. I don't know if you knew that. I don't know if I, I knew that about you. <laughs> How funny. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I have to actually say it's 830. And I know that, um, you know, for as much as I want to keep going with everybody here, there's so much we could talk about. Um, I would love to do a panel at some point, maybe at the end of, you know, see where everybody is with this whole pandemic and, you know, getting their feet wet again. So thank you all so much for joining us. And thank you for everybody who's on Facebook watching um, as well. And if you have any questions on Facebook, and I can't see what's on Facebook right now. So if you're asking questions, maybe we can go ahead and um, at some point throughout the next day or two, um, I'll say, hey, uh, Marcy, there was a question for you, or hey, Ben, there was a question for you. Um, so if anybody has any questions, go ahead and post them in this chat on Facebook, and um, we'll get to them over the course of the next couple of days. So thank you all so much for being here. Thank you um, for taking your time out. I thought it would go a half hour, 45 minutes. We went an hour and a half. And um, thank you for taking that time out of your evening and late night in Belfast, or where are you, London? I'm in London, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's all good, <laughs> all good. So, <laughs> all right. It was lovely thank hearing you. you. And I really appreciate everybody being here and taking the time out. So have a great evening and let's stay in touch for sure. Definitely, <laughs> bye you guys. Thank you, bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. 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 Thank you.